All right, Mike here. I'm gonna make another video on uh, getting started in refrigeration. Now, the last one I did a few uh, a few days ago, I think it was last week, I uh, got a little bit of attention, so I thought I would answer some questions that I've gotten and um, go into something a little more detail. So this one's specifically about refrigerant controls, the ones that I have used, and um, some of my experience with them, some of the pros and cons with them, and uh, so on and so forth. So there's plenty of good videos out there on how capillary tubes work, TXVs, um, hand expansion valves are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but uh, if you're looking to get into this kind of stuff and have a little bit of fun like I do, um, these are some of my experiences. So last year, I used almost primarily the uh, quarter inch needle valve. This is a quarter inch flare. Um, we have a control there, and this is uh, primarily to be used as a as a hand expansion valve. So um, it's just a simple orifice that's adjustable. That's all it is. Uh, this is not intended to be a refrigerant control. Um, it's not really a flow control. Um, <clears throat> well, it is, but um, but not for this purpose. So um, I wouldn't recommend you use this for a very small system, and the reason is it's not very easy to control. Now I'm just going to back the whole needle assembly out of the valve body. See it's called a needle valve but it's kind of a misnomer because you can see that it's got a very wide taper on it and it, it's got a very blunt end to it. Um, you would really want something that's uh, much more pointed, very you know, comes to a fine point um, and has a very long taper such that whenever you adjust it the, the gap between the needle and the valve seat uh, varies gradually as you move it in and out. <laughs> um, this one really doesn't do that so well. Um, but for a larger system, you know, maybe quarter ton or above, um, you have a lot of fun with this. Um, Sean Dobby over at his channel uh, kind of made a hybrid with a capillary tube and a, and a needle valve uh, of sorts, a flow control valve that he got. Uh, kind of fancy, kind of stainless steel setup. Um, it allows him to have a little more control over it. Um, increases the range a little bit, I think. Um, but you have to be careful with that too because when you have cap tube, um, you're gonna get, end up getting some flashing and also with the needle valve, you're gonna get some flashing. So either way, you're gonna end up with some, some gas and not all pure liquid going through one or the other. So um, the first uh, valve that I ever used was this. It's a flow control valve. Um, a buddy of mine gave it to me back in Pennsylvania. It came from like a analytical piece of equipment. Uh, it's a uh, quarter inch, excuse me, eighth inch pipe thread on this, and I adapted it to quarter inch flare. Um, I don't really know what the valve seat of this really looks like. I never backed the thing the whole way out, uh, but I used this thing on a dehumidifier. It was a junk dehumidifier that I had, <coughs> and um, uh, I charged it with propane, put a new filter dryer on it, and uh, I ran this thing in my basement for well over a year, I think it was closer to two years actually. Never had a problem, never had any leaks that I'm aware of. Uh, the thing continued to produce water quite effectively in my basement um, for all that time. I, uh, I honestly think this thing was uh, a little more responsive and a little easier to control. And I don't know why I went to the, the, the needle valve like this. I was looking for some improvement on this. I found this, bought a couple of them on eBay um, for like like five or 10 bucks or something. I couldn't pass it up. Um, but um, you might want to look for something like this if you're looking to do a hand expansion valve. Um, either way, like with this one here, as I said, it was kind of difficult to control and you might only have a very, very small range that you might be working in. Um, I, uh, I found by you know adding an extension to the handle gave me a little more control over it. You might, you might find that yourself. Um, but um, yeah, look around out there. You know, there's not a lot, a lot of hand expansion valves made for refrigeration. It's not really uh, something that's done anymore, uh, except for maybe large industrial plants. Um, another option you might have is an automatic expansion valve. Um, that's just a pressure regulator. Uh, the issue with a pressure regulator is um, it has a set, you know, ha has a simple setting that you might be able to adjust to to some certain extent, but it's not really going to cover the wide range of conditions that your system might be in. Now, I've 
the characteristics of your system or the environment of your system don't change much, well then an automatic expansion valve might just work just fine. Um, it's probably going to work a little better than the hand expansion valve, uh, which is not going to regulate the pressure um, even if the conditions change, whereas an automatic expansion valve will regulate that low side uh, pressure, but that pressure might not be appropriate for the conditions. It might starve the evaporator, it might flood the evaporator. That's where you go to a TXV. Uh, this is a thermostatic expansion valve, also known as a TEV. Um, this one's a quarter ton, originally made for R22. Uh, this inlet, this outlet right here. Uh, we have superheat control at the bottom. We have a sensing bulb. Um, if you read some books on refrigeration, which you really should, uh, you'll learn all about these things. Um, take the bottom off of this. It's not hand tight. It, I just loosened it re previously. And there you can see the fine point of the needle. And it's got a kind of a mating surface, a hole in the bottom there. There's also two pins in there. You see this whole assembly goes together. When you tighten this up, there's pressure put on that spring, which holds the needle up against the, the valve seat. There's a diaphragm here. And uh, internally, by applying pressure through this capillary tube, uh, that, that uh, diaphragm can expand and contract, depending on what the pressure is in here, and uh, push against these the two pins that are in there, against that plate holding the, the needle for the valve, and uh, uh, push it away and, uh, and uh, exert pressure against that spring, allowing refrigerant to flow through. It does that by um, the placement of this sensing bulb on the suction line of the evaporator. Uh, if the evaporator becomes starved, the suction line temperature will increase, which will increase the temperature of the sensing bulb. The sensing bulb, capillary tube, and diaphragm assembly contain a refrigerant, um, generally a saturated refrigerant, liquid and vapor. And uh, when a small amount of heat is applied to that, the pressure rises slightly, uh, increasing the uh, pressure on the diaphragm, pushing on the pins, pushing the needle away from the valve seat, and uh, admitting more refrigerant to the evaporator until the evaporator is properly fed, the suction line temperature drops, the temperature of the sensing bulb drops, saturation temperature inside the uh, system drops, the diaphragm is allowed to uh, retract by the spring applying pressure to it. Um, the amount of superheat that's uh, uh, designed for the system can be adjusted to some extent with this superheat control. Not all TXVs will have a control like this, uh, adjustment like that. Um, some have other features. Some allow you to change the uh, diaphragm head without actually tearing into the entire system. This one's completely fixed. Um, but I don't know a whole lot about TXVs. I'm not a uh, not a refrigeration guy. Um, like I said, this one's about quarter ton. You can um, you're gonna have trouble trying to find one for R290 for propane if that's what you decide to work with. If you decide to work with um, you know. 22 or R134A or uh, 404 or 410, um, you, you shouldn't have any problem finding a TXV uh, for that application. What I decided to do with this, I never used this as a uh, as an actual TXV, although I could have uh, charged this capillary tube or this, this assembly with uh, R290, and uh, I'm sure I could have uh, made something work of it. What I did instead was I brazed this step on here with a quarter inch flare and I built a little air tank. <clears throat> you can see it's an old throwaway disposable propane cylinder. I have a, a low side pressure gauge for a refrigeration system, uh, a regulator that we can charge it with air on that side and by tying this into the capillary tube assembly for the, the diaphragm assembly on the TXV, I turned it into a PXV, a pressure expansion valve. Um, and by simply adjusting the pressure regulator, I could adjust the amount of pressure on the diaphragm and push that spring or, or push that needle away from the valve seat by applying pressure to that, uh, that whole spring assembly in there. And uh, all it really allowed me to do was to have one of these but much easier to control. It was very, very easy to control. Uh, I might have a use for this again someday, uh, but it was a lot of fun to mess around with that. You can get these online pretty cheap. Um, I mean, you know, 
less than 20 or 30 bucks if you find one that's like you know surplus or something. So um, there are a few other types of expansion valves before I get into capillary tubes. Um, there are high side floats and low side floats. Those aren't really used anymore in, uh, definitely not in like residential or any kind of appliances. Um, they were used in domestic appliances back in the 20s and 30s. More low side floats in the 20s and more high side floats in the 30s. Um, not really something that you're going to find anymore. Not something you're, unless you're going to build it yourself, which is pretty nifty, in which case make a video and send it to me. I'd like to learn, I'd like to, to see what you find. Um, the low side floats were simply a, um, a tank in the top of the evaporator, the, the, the header of the evaporator. And it had a float inside that was uh, uh, sat on a, on a bed of, of liquid refrigerant. And uh, depending on how much refrigerant was being boiled, boil, boiled away in the evaporator and the, uh, the load on the evaporator, if the refrigerant level started to drop, and the evaporator was starting to get slightly starved, the float would drop and it would emit more refrigerant in. And then likewise, whenever it would rise, it would close it off, just like a toilet tank valve. A uh, high side float worked on basically the same principle, but the exact opposite, worked on the high side and kind of regulated the uh, uh, subcooling in the high side. So uh, well-designed system uh, worked great. So capillary tube, uh, talked about this a little bit in the past, is what I use currently. Uh, it's just long, thin uh, length of copper tubing that's drawn out to uh, have a very, very small inside diameter. This one is uh, .036 inches inside diameter. Um, as I said before, you have to look at some charts, figure out depending on what your, your load conditions, your compressor size, type of refrigerant you're using, the application, and so on, what kind of capillary tube that you should uh, you should get. The great stuff, the great thing about this stuff is uh, there's nothing mechanical involved as long as it's uh, uh, clean and dry, filtered, uh, your, your refrigerant line is filtered properly before the capillary tube. Stuff will last a very, very long time. <clears throat> and um, unlike a fixed orifice, which doesn't... Uh, has no way to regulate uh, refrigerant flow through it and the, uh, the conditions, the capillary tube can do that to a certain extent. Uh, capillary tube can uh, uh, maintain a liquid plug before it in a, in a relatively wide range of, of ambient conditions, unlike a fixed orifice. For instance, if we go back to the, the needle valve, the hand expansion valve, we set it up. Um, we're getting, uh, we're feeding the evaporator well. Um, our, uh, our subcooling is acceptable, and then um, say the ambient conditions rise, the kitchen heats up, whatever, whatever environment that the the machine is running in, uh, and the uh, ambient temperature rises, the head pressure could rise. The uh, amount of surface area in the in the uh, high side used for uh, subcooling decreases. Um, as the uh, more of the surface area is used to condense, and eventually you could end up in a condition where uh, pure, you know, hot gas is passing through this expansion valve into the low side. Uh, we could also have issues with uh, how well the evaporator is fed. So in a in a well-designed system where the capillary tube is the right length, the heat exchangers and the capillary and the compressor are uh, reasonably well matched. Uh, capillary tube has the ability to regulate subcooling to a certain extent and uh, keep the evaporator well fed. Um, it does this because capillary tube is uh, generally when it's installed, it's long and thin. It's usually at least five feet long. And uh, it doesn't work by it like a simple orifice um, because the capillary tube uh, does not pass gas very well. It becomes very turbulent and raises the pressure. So if we have one of those high ambient conditions where uh, the temperature is rose and uh, subcooling is non-existent. We start to get gas passing through here. It creates very turbulent flow and a lot of back pressure, which raises the head pressure up. The temperature of the condenser increases sufficiently that uh, uh, it's able to discharge uh, sufficient heat and condense the liquid out, maintaining a, uh, a liquid plug on the capillary tube. So it's kind of nifty stuff, um, but do your research and figure out what it is that you want to... Uh, do and, and, and uh, what do you need to do it. Um, I did this whole thing on the background of a pressure enthalpy curve just because it was something that was white and it looks better than my workbench here. 
So um, what I'd like to do is to make another video on pressure enthalpy diagrams because um, <laughs> there's not a lot of them out there, not a lot of videos explain how these things work um, that aren't uh, some kind of engineering school. And uh, I think uh, they're very interesting and they are very, uh, can be very educational. It's a good way to refrigeration in my opinion. So we're gonna give that a go here soon. Thanks. Uh, an addendum to that video here, I just wanted to mention that if you do use one of these types of valves or something similar to it, that uh, there's a nut on here with an O-ring, and you have to make sure that that thing is firmed up tight, but not too tight, because you won't be able to adjust the valve at all. And uh, too loose, obviously it's going to leak. Um, these things can be a problem if you're going to use one for, you know, kind of long term, uh, especially if your evaporator temperatures are very low and this thing frosts over, it will frost over. Uh, if you try to adjust it while it's extremely cold, you could have issues with that valve packing in there uh, leaking on you because uh, you're going to have some, some contraction of the, the valve packing. It's not going to make a proper seal and you're going to start getting refrigerants leaking out of there, which is, which is no good. Um, again, I wouldn't recommend these for anything long term. Um, this thing worked quite well for long term. Uh, but uh, the you know the conditions that my dehumidifier were operating in were pretty constant. It was in a basement, uh, so you know if you're going to do anything long term, my highest recommendation is capillary tubing, unless the uh, system is rather large, and then I'd probably go with a TXV. Um, or if you want to get fancy, you can get into an electronic expansion valve. But uh, I'm not going to give you any recommendations on that. I don't know much about them other than the basic operation. So that's about it. Thanks.